podcast party. Descent into a verse. My name is Renaissance. My friends and I have come to the Tower of Erm, looking for a way to free a djinn from an infernal contract. We've just learned that the master of the tower is the legendary wizard Mordenkainen, and now we're face to face with him. You now stand in front of this rather tall and imposing figure who has called himself Mordenkainen. Do we know who that is? Good question. Make a history check. Corbin rolled a natural one for a four. <laughs> Renaissance got a 13. Island got a 10. She sort of remembers hearing it somewhere, but has no idea who he is, probably. And Ophelia got a 12. Renaissance and Ophelia. Although your recollection isn't exact, you have definitely heard of this figure. He's sort of more of a legend than an actual person, per se. Like a Johnny Appleseed type? Yeah, like a Johnny Appleseed. Absolutely. Like a, like a Johnny Appleseed who could potentially end the world if he wanted to. How about that? <laughs> mm. Okay. I stand up as straight as I can, and I say, My Lord Mordenkainen, we come to you with a plea for help. We're in desperate need of your assistance. He rolls his eyes and sighs. Oh, another day, another plea for help. What is it this time? Briefly, sir, we've made a compact with a Dao. Ralzala guards the demon zapper, some distance to the a sort of gesture behind me. Well, it was the southwest, but now it seems to have shifted somewhat. But the demon zapper, there's a unicorn imprisoned in it. Oh, yes, I have seen it from afar. Well, I was perhaps killed, or uh, at least very, very badly hurt by a demon trying to scale the tower to reach the unicorn. My friend Corbin here was able to Help me with some diamond dust provided by Ralzala. In exchange for his assistance, the Dao has requested that we free him from his assignment in guarding the demon zapper. And it was at the Dao's suggestion that we've come to see you to ask for your help. Perhaps there's some service we can provide for you in return. He starts to sort of stroke his Van Dyke beard. And he's just sort of listening. He hasn't interrupted you. He's just sort of staring at you with these steely eyes. And after you finish, he waits about two or three seconds, arches an eyebrow, and says, Why are you here? I don't mean for the reasons that you have just given to me. I ask you, and he steps a little closer to you, Renaissance. And how tall are you, Renaissance? You're like six foot five or something like that? About six three. He's shorter than you. Maybe six foot one. But as he steps towards you, he sort of has this aura. It feels like he might just step through you. Like if you didn't take a step back. I swallow. It's, um, the, uh, the city of Elturel has been stolen from the Sword Coast by the archdevil who rules this plain. I'm sure you know the lady. I won't mention her by name at this time, sir. But, um... <laughs> We've come to see if we could uh, help the city and its people to uh, return to the Sword Coast. Yeah, as you start to like mention this, like back on the balcony, those Nykoloths who have flown you up here, they're all sort of like listening in on the conversation. And Shrawl says to the one of the other Nykoloths, he goes, <laughs> I saw that one come down. That was really good. And as he says that, Morgan kind of just raises a hand. He doesn't even look at the Nykoloth on the balcony, he just raises a hand towards it, and the Nykoloth's eyes just bug out of its skull. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he slowly glances over to the Nykoloth and he says, Speak when spoken to. And then slowly moves his eyes back to you and says, My apologies for my vassal. Continue. None taken, your, mag your, your mageness. <laughs> <laughs> we came to Elturel with the help of a, a wizard who had a tuning fork. He was a, a wizard who lived near Candlekeep, and his name was... Help, help me out, Hylan. Uh, his name was, um, uh, he was Otter like Octavius. 
No, nope, not like a little. <laughs> okay, I've got no. I've got it here. I I start frantically flipping through my your notes, my dog eared prayer book with my notes. Uh, Traxigor, Traxigor, <laughs> Traxigor. There you go. Yeah, Traxigor, uh, not a with a tuning fork. Y- you'll have to uh, f- uh, forgive me, um, uh, Lord uh, Mordenkind, and I've been mostly dead all day. I it was a weasel. <laughs> Wasn't he a weasel? No, he was an otter. He was an otter. Stop, stop trying to fuck me up, Corbett. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> That's all you've contributed. He's a weasel. Why, why are you so nervous? It's all right. Because, well, I, I don't know. It's just he sort of has an air of awesomeness, you know? Mordenkainen, and- he doesn't rebuke you for saying that, nor does he sort of show any shame. He sort of just takes a deep breath and says, so in short... It is the city of Elturel has come to you to be its saviors. Yes, in a way, the city of Elturel has come to us for assistance, and in turn, we are coming to you for yours. What would be gained from returning the city of Elturel back to Toril? He doesn't say that arrogantly. He simply asks that sort of a very matter-of-fact kind of way. What about all the people there? All the downtrodden and the... The kind people and the good people, you just let them all stay here, suffer and die? I say I think he may be operating on a less sentimental and more metaphysical plane, Corbin. My lord, the archdevil who rules this plane is trying to recruit the entire population of that city to serve as a vassals in the blood war. It could have very, very dire ramifications for that conflict and the um, status quo, so to speak, of this entire plane. Also, if they're allowed to come and steal an entire city, I don't see what will stop them from stealing more, and there will be a huge imbalance. That's true. Very inconvenient, sir. Cities just being popped down to Avernus when you might like to borrow a library book, for example. When you, Highland, say the word imbalance, his head literally snaps in your direction. And I want you to make an insight check. Mm, an 11. Clearly, that word has set him off. His whole demeanor changes to less accusatory and more interested. And he says, the balance. Well, balance must be maintained in the universe, of course. Just so. You say, this city has been brought down by the Lady Zariel. He says that without any any hint of fear. I wince a little bit. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, stolen is how I would describe it. Stolen. As you know, fiends, specifically devils, operate on a very specific set of terms. Those terms are set forth in contracts. If it was indeed the plot to steal this city and all of its inhabitants by the devil, Zario, clearly it was not simply taken. It was granted to her. She made a compact with the high overseer of Elturel, Thavius Krieg. He was somehow able to sell the souls of the entire city to her. So, the city itself? And all its people. I don't think that all the people that were a part of that compact, I don't think that they had any idea of the terms to which they were agreeing. They didn't. In my opinion, yes, Thavius Krieg made a compact but all of those people, they was stolen because they didn't knowingly enter into such a bargain. And I'm hoping that because of that, there might be a way to void it. He strokes his beard again and says, If it is your intent to void this contract, you realize, of course, that you will come into the crosshairs of Zario, and perhaps all of hell itself will be against you. We've already run afoul of one of her lieutenants. And if you intend to wrest this city back from whence it came, the four of you? Oh, and... This is Lulu. He sort of like points at Lulu. Lulu sort of comes out. She has been hiding the entire time. As soon as Mordenkainen turned around, she just hid behind Corbin and stayed there. Her head sort of peeks up from behind Corbin's back. And Mordenkainen sort of furrows his brow and says, What is the Celestial doing here? She's our friend. She, um, agreed to come and help us. She was with Traxigor on the Sword Coast. It seems as if she may have been here before, to Avernus. 
She's having trouble with her memory. Oh, I have had that experience myself. It is not a pleasant one. I understand why she would travel with ones such as you. If it is your choice to attempt to rebalance this situation as maintaining the equilibrium across the cosmos once and above all is my true goal, I am in support of this. Excellent. So you'll, you'll help us with the Tao. What is it that the Tao wishes to do? To be free of his service. Free of his service to Zarya. Well, I can think of several things that may, in fact, aid you. If you wish to free this creature, then it is a gruesome item that you must obtain. It is the blood of a titan. Okay. If this Ralzala wishes to free itself, then it must drink the blood of a titan. Have you got any just on hand? I sort of look hopefully over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> there are a great deal of implements and flasks and tubes and strange alchemical items. You see, there's a giant book uh, on the table. One of the largest books you've ever seen standing on a portion of the table that's sort of a raised, almost like a lectern. He doesn't even glance behind him. He says, no, there is no such item of that import here. Although the things I could do with it, hmm, I could create a new spell. He sort of like takes his beard and sort of begins to sort of tug at it like a nervous tick. Yes, yes, Mordenkainen's, he sort of puts his hand up in front of him like he's like the marquee to a theater. <laughs> Mordenkainen's Titanic Infusion. I like the sound of that. Yes. But no, 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 you wish to, of course, use this blood. Um... Have you perhaps heard of Uldrak's grave? Have we? No. It is a place here on the plain of Avernus. We look on the map. I'm hoping he will point. Yeah, maybe we show him the map. Yeah. Maybe Lulu knows? Lulu, like, looks over your shoulder as you sort of put it on the table next to Mordenkind, and she doesn't indicate any place on the map that she thinks might be Uldrak's grave. But as you put the map on the table, Mordenkind's eyebrows both go up as if... He's never seen anything like this before. He says, what a wonderful and delightful map. Where did you obtain this? Traxagor. The little weasel guy gave it. He's an otter. He's not a weasel. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look the same. They do not. He was definitely an aquatic mammal, sir, with a tuning fork. Uh, whatever that may be, this map itself is quite interesting. And he raises his hand and places it over the map, closes his eyes, and you watch as the map and all of its inscriptions sort of begin to glow. And he takes this hand that he has over the map and sort of raises it so it is now vertical in the air. And then he takes his other hand in a very sort of Doctor Strange kind of way and starts to encircle his hand in a, in a circular motion around his other hand. The fingers begin to glow and out of his fingers, little wisps of golden light begin to fly out. And in front of you now, almost like a holographic display, you see this map now in front of you, like in a sort of space, maybe a five by 10 area space in front of you. He says, this may perhaps be easier for all involved. And he sort of looks at Lulu and Lulu looks at Mordenkainen and just backs off. So I, I'm sorry, I, I was just look, I was just looking. And he points at an area on the map in front of you where there is an enormous sword implanted in the ground. If the scale of the map is correct and the demon zapper is the size of a building, this sword is probably the same size, maybe a little smaller. Oh boy. Looks like the sword of a titan. Indeed. And he begins to sort of trace with his finger and writes letters in common and says, this is Uldrak's grave. Is Uldrak a titan? Or was Uldrak a titan? He looks at you and the corners of his mouth turn up a little bit and he says, Well, he's not what he used to be. If we manage to claim some of his blood, will the Tao know how to use it? Shall we bring it directly to the Tao? Yes, of course. How much blood will the Tao need to drink? Not all of it. Titans have quite a lot of blood in them. 
this much. And he takes like a, a flask off of his table and unstoppers it. It's empty and hands it to you. I see. Thank you. You want us to bring you some? He takes his hand off of his head where he's sort of been massaging his temple and says, I am leaving Avernus quite soon. I and my tower are needed elsewhere. We certainly appreciate your taking the time to lend us your assistance and advice, sir. I'm wondering if there's any way you could sort of point us in the direction of the fastest route to Aldrak's grave? He grins and says, How long have you been here in Avernus? Very difficult question to answer, sir, on account of time being a bit funny. How long do you feel you've been in Avernus? A few days. Distances change here in Avernus all the time, as well as directions. However, if you would consider this place in the somewhat center of Avernus, and he places his hand on the Tower of Urm in the middle section of the map, he says, then Uldrak's grave is... And he puts his two fingers up on each hand, almost like in a quotation mark, and he says, south, perhaps, of here. In the case your encounter at Uldrak's grave does not bear any fruit, there is someone else who I may guide you to, but he is in a separate area of Vernus, a different direction entirely. Who is this other person? A mage of little renown. It might be best if we knew who he was and where to find him as well. His name is lost to time. He seems to be interested in an area of Avernus around an obelisk. Seems to hold some kind of arcane power. Can you show us a gesture to the image of the map that he's projected? He smiles and points his finger towards an area on the fringe of Avernus. I guess you could call it the northwest corner. Beyond a bubbling lake of some kind of fluid, there is a enormous black stone obelisk, which seems to be, if you look carefully, surrounded by some other smaller stones. Right, so if things go south with a titan blood, or if um, we should become separated, that would be our next best hope. It is your choice. What do you call this place? The obelisk. Straightforward. And what makes you inclined to think he would help us? There is always the quid pro quo. Yeah, I was going to say, if he's come to Avernus, odds are it's not for a sort of vacation or day trip. He wants something here, which means that maybe we've got something to give him or to get for him. That is the way of things here. Why are you here, if it is not too presumptuous of me to ask? He sort of crosses his arms and says, For the sake of the balance, I must keep my finger upon the pulse of all things. Good, evil, order. Chaos. Of all the places in the multiverse where things are out of sorts, this is amongst the top three. If you have the power to bring El Terrell back to the surface out of Avernus, and you are committed to restoring and maintaining the balance here in Avernus, why would you not just restore the city? My dear, how long have you been alive? I've been alive about 30 years. I have been in existence longer than you can imagine. I have seen wars come and go. I have seen titans blossom into existence and then fade like the light of a dying star. Small events, like the flapping of a small bird battering its wings against a pond, create ripples. Those ripples have effects elsewhere, and those events echo across the worlds and eventually tip the balance. My task is to keep a finger on every single ripple and ensure that the balance never sways too violently. If I were to aid you in bringing El Terrell back, certainly it would tip the balance in one direction. But then, those ripples may in fact have ramifications on the powers of order, weakening them to the point where the powers of chaos may in fact overrun Avernus itself. You know, I've been around for a while on Avernus, and I must say, devils are a very interesting lot. Have you had any experience with them? Fortunately, yes. Devils look at mortals as sheep, except devils see themselves not as wolves, but as shepherds. Shepherds fleece sheep by the season, but then slaughter them as needed. A shepherd likely kills the wolves that threaten its sheep. But then again, shepherds always expect to lose a few sheep in the process. And if you were a sheep, would you trust the shepherd? We appreciate your wisdom, sir. I think it's uh, best if we wasted no more of your very valuable time. 
If you wouldn't mind, um, I'd sort of gesture towards the creatures that are watching us. Perhaps just uh, lift back across to our vehicle. Of course, of course. Pleasure to meet you four. Best of luck saving the world. And he smiles. <laughs> we'll do our best, sir. As you turn to leave, Mordenkainen looks at the shield on your back and says, <laughs> Oh, you didn't listen to a word I said. I pretend I didn't hear that. Corbin does, and Corbin stops. You know something about that, sir? He says, Oh, yes, of course. Could you tell us, please? <laughs> <laughs> As he begins to speak, renaissance in your head, Gargoth says, Whatever you say is a lie. Do not listen to a word that man says. It is a lie. Mordenkainen says, Well, that shield is the shield of the fallen lord, of course. I know him by a different name. Hidden, not fall. Gargoth, I suppose he calls himself, yes? We've got a thing where I, I call him Gargs. <laughs> His laugh is just like <laughs> enormous and just like peels out. He's like, I have not heard him called that. I suppose he detests it. <laughs> He'd prefer to be called the Hidden Lord these days, I gather. Yes, yes. He's a bit uh, stuck. Yes, he is, isn't he? I was wondering if um, you might know anything about how he came to be in it and, well, if necessary, how he might come to be out of it. He comes close and he sort of doesn't touch the shield, puts his hand over this enormous demonic face inscribed on the shield and he says, I think with time he'll tell you. In my head I think, is that so, Gargs? Do you know a way to get out? Gargoth says, I do, but I, I, I cannot, I cannot speak it. I, I, I cannot. Mordenkainen says, yes you can, Gargoth. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, you can hear him? It's getting crowded in here. <laughs> Mordenkainen literally is now, like, he's not in your head, he's speaking the words. Gargoth is, is now... Get out of this place immediately. I cannot stand this man. I thought you wanted out, Gargs. I thought that was the whole, the whole, I, I spread my arms. Gargoth says, I do, I do, I want, I want to get out, but there are specific circumstances, circ I can't, I, I am not, I am... This is me, I'm trying to help you, Gargs. Help you help me. Uh, sir, sorry. Gogs, hold on a moment. I, I sort of stick my index finger in the air. You were saying, I gesture towards Mordenkainen. Mordenkainen says, you may have picked up an item there, which has a great deal of power inside of it. But inside as well, there is a, an entity which can be utilized as a bargaining chip. Gargoth, like, rages. He's like, I am no bargaining chip! Oh, uh, he, he don't like that. He don't like to be called a chip. I think you've, <laughs> you've, you've touched a nerve there, sir. I appreciate your advice, sir. More important than you realize, actually. Did you trap him in there, sir? Mordenkainen, when you say these words, looks over at you, Corbin, and says, Me personally? No. But I know who did. Yeah, who, who put him in here? And then he puts his finger aside his nose and says, Ah! Spoilers. Well, I suppose Gargs will tell me when he's ready. Sir, could I ask one little bitty question, sir, uh, please? He looks at his wrist in which a strange device has appeared, a strange circular device with numbers all around and little metallic hands clicking every second. You've never seen anything like it before. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead. I don't have a lot of time. I was wondering if you ever heard of a devil or a fiend called Bell or Bells, something like that. Bell, yes, of course. Bell, Bell, Bell. Bell used to be the Duke here. Oh. Before Zariel. And you said, used to be, what happened? Oh, he was displaced. Demoted. Oh. Sucks for him. Sure, it sucks for him. Thank you, sir. The Nykoloths on the balcony who have been cowed into <laughs> fealty and terror by Mordenkainen's words haven't said a peep since, and so are ready to take you back down to your vehicle on the other side. So those, uh, those things, they ain't going to drop us halfway across, are they? He looks at them and they just shake their heads now. No, they won't. Can I insight check them? Like, I can see they're terrified of him, but like, just like, does it look like they're just biding their time until he's not looking at them? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a difficult insight check, but go for it. It's only a 10. Based on their body language, you're guessing no. 
I sort of point one gauntleted finger at one of them. I say, don't you don't fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> the bossal ear of it. The Yugalok that you pointed your finger at looks at you and says, no, nope, don't worry, won't, won't, uh, won't fuck you. Right. I find that totally reassuring. Thank you again, sir. Yes, thank you for your help. As you fly away from the Tower of Erm, Mordenkainen steps back from the balcony inside the tower, and the balcony itself completely disappears, almost as if it becomes part of the tower itself. The tower has three sort of spiky points, which sort of splay out at the top. As you watch, those spiky points retract and touch at the top. So they're now sort of three points touching like a, like a pyramid now. At the base of the tower, you see these enormous iron locking mechanisms or something like that. They unlock, they go and they open up and you watch as the tower begins to swivel and turn. It turns at a frenetic pace, creating kind of almost like a whirlwind in the air of dust. The Nykoloths at its base put up their clawed hands to their eyes as the Tower of Erm, in a whirlwind of magical force, disappears into the multiverse. Hi, everybody. The show will be back shortly for the second half. First, it's time to tell you how you can play D&D with us. Cast Party's professional dungeon masters are available to hire for online games. We have games for kids as well as adults, and our DMs can run almost any of the official Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventures, as well as third-party adventures, and even some we've created ourselves. If you enjoy Podcast Party, please follow the show, rate us, and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. Message us on social media or email us at info at cast-party.com. Follow us on Facebook at Cast Party DND, on Twitter at Cast Party 2, on Instagram at Cast underscore Party, or on TikTok at Cast underscore Party. Thanks very much for listening, and now back to our adventure in Avernus. Well, that was something. Wizen, you missed it. It was Mordenkainen. You'd have loved it. Who was that guy? Mordenkainen. I know I heard his name. Well, he's a very famous wizard. He's powerful magic. You, you, you got the gist of it, I think. I mean, I know what a wizard is, but... Oh, this is a legendary wizard. You know, not, not like a run-of-the-mill... I don't think he can be that famous if I never heard of him. <laughs> I just don't believe it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he seemed nice, so all right. All right, why isn't everything all right? I start spreading out the map. We've got a new destination for you. I point where Aldrak's grave is marked. Okay. Big sword, dead titan. Yeah, I've, n I've never, never been there. Well, here's to New Horizons. Point this thing towards Aldrak's grave. All righty. You w want someone else to operate it? No, no, no. A bad idea. I don't want you to, like, drive it into, like, the sticks or, or off a cliff or something like that. I got it. I just want to go over to Renaissance and say, um, that was pretty impressive meeting someone like that. Don't say I never take you anywhere. <laughs> it reminded me of something, though. I've been thinking when you came back, um, I kept saying, don't ever do that again. And that's... That's how I feel, but the truth is, that's not the kind of situation we're in. And it's too selfish. Speaking with that wizard, is he? <laughs> he reminded me that there is a bigger picture here, and I love you with all my heart, but it's possible that our time is... I don't know when our time will be. I get it, Highland. Nobody can promise I won't die. Only a fool or a liar can promise you they're going to live forever. I promise you that I will always love you, even if I do put my foot in it again and something happens to me. Just get to Celestia, okay? We just have to get to Celestia. We have to get these people home, and maybe we'll still be here when it's over, but we have to focus on the task at hand now. But I, I'm here for you. I just, I can't be as selfish as I want to be. That's all. Yeah. I unstrapped the shield from my back and put it over one arm, kind of bang it once against the side of the war machine. I say, Wizen! Yeah! Aldrax Grave. 
You got it, Chief. And he turns the key in the ignition. Let's make that travel roll. Luckily, you do have an idea of where you're going. Okay. 2d6. Okay. Don't screw it up or we're all going to hate you. Okay, the first one is a six. Goonies always make mistakes. Just don't make any more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That's a three. Okay, so they do not match. Okay. And so you end up, wow, there's some like a lot of tension released there. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I died, you, Matt. I died. <laughs> <laughs> In one shot, I might add. Yeah. As you travel again through the plains of Avernus, kicking up dust and silt and bones and all kinds of stuff that the plains of Avernus are comprised of, you pass through the south and you don't see the demon zapper. You see enormous clouds of yellow dust that almost seem like there's some kind of sentience to them. When they converge together, it's almost like the tendrils of yellow dust lovingly embrace one another with these enormous yellow fingers. That's hot. You see giant clouds of acid rain that pour their contents over the ghastly plains of hell, and whatever is underneath them, you just see clouds of stinking vapor erupt from the ground. And even from this distance, you hear the screams of whatever is under the ground there. The clouds do not move. They stay in place and just rain their contents. You pass by groves of blackened trees, which look almost like skeletal hands, and giant floating black blobs with tentacles coming out of the back of them. They seem to be maybe a hundred feet in the air, trailing their ghastly tentacles behind like some kind of horrible mutated jellyfish. It's another beautiful day in Avernus. Enjoying the sights. It appears on the horizon as sort of this monolithic shape or shadow rising out of the ground and against the the red backdrop of the of the skies of Avernus you are able to make out the hilt and sort of bottom portion of the blade of a sword you're still probably about 10 15 miles away and you can still see it so it is truly kind of an enormous edifice so we think this titan is dead i got the sense that maybe it wasn't totally dead. I don't think it is dead. There's dead and then there's dead, like our friend Gideon Lightward, you know? Yeah. It's a grave, right? I thought it was his grave. There just was grave. It is his grave. Right. But there was a lot of things in the graveyard in Elturel that was dead, but still moving around. Fair enough. We're supposed to get blood from it somehow. As we're approaching, I just want to sort of scan the, the area around the sword and see if I can see any creatures or any other structures near it as we get closer and closer. Okay, I can help like in you. front of you or to the side of you or behind you or? Close to the sword. So I guess in front of, uh, like between us and the sword, in the area around the sword. Make a perception check. I'll help you. Okay, that's going to be pretty good. That's a total of 22. Although there isn't anything that you can see specifically around the sword, to, I guess you would call it the west, the silty white plains of Avernus merge into this sort of gray, charred terrain, almost as if it's been blasted by some enormous force. The ground of Avernus itself has been blasted by some enormous flame or explosive force, and that lasts for miles, all the way to the horizon, as far as you can see. Within that space, you see clouds of dust being kicked up by something. You're not quite sure what it is, but with a 22, you are able to hear that there is an enormous sound of of some kind of mechanism or, or multiple mechanisms with loud screaming engines, just like the one coming from the engine of the vehicle that you ride. There are multiple soul engines off to the west. Corbin would like to look around, but he's looking more for anybody following us or trailing us, enemies. Make a perception check of your own. Uh, 15. And you look behind you. You don't see anyone chasing you. You don't see anything as far as the eye can see behind you. Wizen sort of like lifts his goggles. And he stops the engine. And he lifts his goggles off of his, off of his face. And his face is just coated with dust. 
and he sort of wipes it off of off of the top portion of his head and looks out to where you're looking, Renaissance. And he says, "Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be an interesting one." What is it, Wizen? Did Maggie tell you about uh, the rest of the of the warlords? She mentioned that there were warlords, and of course, uh, I believe we are driving the vehicle that belonged to one of them. Oh yeah, that's uh, Raga Draga. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank God that piece of shit's dead. But uh, yeah, there are others. So much worse than Raga Draga. You wouldn't believe. What do you think our chances are of giving that uh, wide berth? Oh yeah, no, I have no problem doing that. Yeah, just uh, you know, drive casual. But don't look like you're trying to drive casual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that uh, they won't see us. I mean, listen, I, not many of these gangs are in any way friendly at all. Uh, their leaders are giant assholes. I don't mean physically, like, you know, hell has a lot of things. But no, they, they are not that. But yeah, they are. I mean, if you want more details, I can tell you about each of the, of the leaders. But uh, they're all garbage. Perhaps as we drive? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll No problem. And he just sort of like takes the, the gear ship and slowly moves towards the sword. As he drives towards Aldrak's grave, begins to comment on the, the various warlords that he's knowledgeable of. He says, well, first there's, uh, there's Bitter Breath. Bitter Breath uh, used to be a horned devil in the infernal army. He committed treason. Daryl chopped off his wings and made his words turn to smoke. <laughs> so he can't actually, can't actually speak. He's, uh, he's got a kind of a mean streak on him. But he's still a devil. Oh, yeah, he's still a devil. He just doesn't have any wings, and yeah, he's got himself a nice little gang there. Now, what exactly do the warlords do? Do they just sort of loot and pillage and, and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, they sort of try to keep the the land that they've already uh, taken for their own, and yeah, they're, they're basically just roving gangs of warlord landowners. Uh, I mean, Zariel obviously controls the whole of Avernus, but she leaves the details of uh, making sure that everything is done outside, of course, of the Blood War to uh, to the warlords that decide to take power of their own. Mm-hmm. Sounds a lot like Baldur's Gate. Only up there we call them patriarchs instead of warlords. But they're all trying to carve their own little piece of the pie. Yep, and trying to carve each other out, of course, as you can see with Ragged Raga. But some have a little bit more of a uh, convivial way of, of dealing with people who come to Avernus. I mean, as long as you have something to bargain with, they're, they're, they're going to be kind to you. I mean, look at Maggie. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, she was real charming. So uh, that that's one of them, Bitter Breath. Then there's uh, Princeps Kovic. He's a, he's a chain devil. Yeah, also used to be part of the Infernal Army. Right. He got kind of dissatisfied with uh, the Infernal Hierarchy decided to sort of strike out on his own. He got a gang uh, of similarly uh, disillusioned fiends. Calls him the Eighth Remnant. I don't know if he wants to be the next big deal, but uh, we'll see. Anybody else we should know about? Uh, let me think. Eh, a couple more. There's Feanor. I mean, she's no devil. She's a, she's actually a human. Bald as a cue ball, but she's a, she's a ruthless necromancer. Huh. Uh, as her crew, she's instead of devils, she's got uh, these uh, sort of spooky spirits. <laughs> she's got this uh, crazy golden war machine. See it from miles away, but uh, don't think she really cares because that thing is fast as hell and can run you down. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the ghouls and skeletons and gas that she's got at her command that uses willy nilly, I don't think she really cares. What's she doing here if she's human? You know, I never got the chance to ask her. Fair enough. Why would Zariel allow those who had uh, crossed her to still have any sort of measure of power here in Avernus? You know, you've got a great point there, Ophelia. I'm coming to the last one, and I think that you might understand why. She's a, what's called a Cambian. You ever heard of a, of a Cambian? Maybe. You could make a religion check. Corbin rolled a 21. And All Renaissance, right. Renaissance got a so 19. So did Ophelia. I got a four, no idea. Corbin, Renaissance, and Ophelia, you know what a Cambian is. They're not tieflings. Tieflings are descendants of those who have made either devilish or demonic pacts, which have affected their genealogy. Cambians are literally spawns of fiends. Hmm. They are usually very similar to their demonic or devilish parents in terms of their look and powers. And what was her name? Her name is Lilxori. Yeah, Lilx is, uh, 
given reign by her mother, Lady Zario, oh. to become a, uh, well, a hunter of uh, errant warlords. Oh. Yeah. She's there to maintain the powers of Zariel in the Blood War, and if warlords are counteracting that, then, well, that's where Luxori and her crew, they come on in to, to handle the mess. You know, it's funny, as, as you guys were entering, I was just talking to Maggie about Luxori, and Maggie was telling me about how she heard rumor that Luxori was actually in league with someone else. Uh, didn't really understand who she was talking about, but someone new to Avernus. You mean someone who might be acting counter to Zariel's interests? I, I don't know. I, I think actually kind of the, the opposite. Someone who is very much a, a vassal of, of Zariel who decided to team up with Luxori. Right. Did she say anything about the person or the being? Yeah, I mean, she said she was new to Avernus. It was a, it was a, a she, I think. She mentioned it was a, it was a woman. Uh, that's all I know. Lulu, does this uh, Luxori, that name, mean anything to you? I don't know anybody named Luxori. Right, so maybe not part of one of Zariel's original crew, not a Hellrider. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, if she's a Cambian, then... Right. I would say absolutely not. Why, isn't does she have any other names that she goes by? Who, Luxori? Yeah. I mean, her crew is, uh, the Hunters. Uh, that's pretty much it. It's about this time that you all arrive at Uldrax Grip. Probably a hundred feet away, you see that there is a sword, an enormous sword, that lies half buried in this ashen plain. Near to it, maybe 30 or 40 feet away, there is a helmet. This is no helmet of normal humanoid size. This helmet is probably the size of a truck, and it has an enormous crack running through the top and back of it. The other thing that you notice, even from this distance, is at the very top of the sword and the pommel, there is some kind of gleaming scarlet light. Can we see inside the helmet from this angle? No. Okay. The helmet's lying on its side on the ground, mm -hmm. and we're yeah. approaching, so the sort of top of the helmet is effectively in front of us. Yeah, much of the helmet is also buried in ash, too, so. Got it. You said there's a red, like a light on the top? Yeah, there seems to be some kind of glowing red light at the top of the pommel. And we make it out as we get closer what it possibly is? You're about 100 feet away. It seems to be some kind of spherical object that's glowing with red light. Once the war machine pulls within about 60 feet of the helmet, I want to take out the dreidel and spin it. Or I guess maybe a little closer because I'd sort of like to encompass the helmet as much as possible in it. Sure. The, uh, the helmet's about 15 feet by 10 feet. Are there any other, like, I know the helmet's not a building, but like other buildings or sort of points of interest that look like something might be able to hide behind them or inside them? But do I see any tunnel entrances or anything like that? You don't see any tunnel entrances. There's sort of this sort of jutting, enormous gout of ash, which the sword is stuck into, and then the helmet right by it. But you don't see any tunnels. Corbin is going to touch Renaissance on the head and go, be vigilant, and I'm going to give him the Vigilant Blessing so he can have advantage on initiative. Cheers, Corbin. I'm just clutching the dreidel, like, tightly enough that it bites into my palm a little bit. So you are using it, though, yeah? Yeah, once we get within range of where I feel it, using it would cover a chunk of where the helmet is, I will spin it. You spin it, it floats a little bit off your palm, goes past Celestial, goes past Undead, and lands on Fiend. Thanks for listening. This episode featured the Dungeon Master stylings of Matt Gordon, with Andy Canistra as pain bearer Corbin Shiv, Carolyn Fox as Hyland, Rachel Tamarin as Ophelia, and me, Tal Aviazer, as Renaissance. This episode was edited by Carolyn Fox and me. Our original theme music is by Lauren Anker and Anthony Damaso. Some sound effects in this episode are courtesy of Sirenscape. Remember, if you enjoy Podcast Party, please follow the show, rate us, and leave us a review. All right. Now we're cooking with guests.